Hello, and welcome to the next edition of Meat Cutting Lecture. This is day four. Today we're going to talk about connective tissue. Collagen is found everywhere. As we talked about before, it's omnipresent when we're talking about the myofibril, the smallest form of the muscle. What surrounds that and holds it in place and which helps to identify the actual fiber of the muscle is collagen itself. Collagen makes up 50% of connective tissue in the body. It's found everywhere. Skin, hair, fingernails. Uh, it's the bone. It's the bony, bendy part in your nose and in your ears. If it's if it's something that is flexible and soft, it's something that's going to be primarily cartilage. Um, it's found on the interior of the bones in the fall in the form of a collagen matrix. And what I'm talking about there is, let's imagine that we took a cross section of a femur. So imagine for a wheel, you have a hollow pipe in front of you. In a young animal, such as veal, which is why we use these bones for demi, uh, they have a very hollow bone. But if you were to take your finger and take that pipe and hold and push your finger into that hole, you'd feel kind of the soft gooeyness that is that is the the marrow itself. But on the edges or the exterior of that pipe, as you're pushing your finger in on the walls, you'd feel tiny little pricks of calcium deposits. As that animal ages, those calcium deposits begin to pick up more and more calcium. That process is called ossification, or the process by which the bone fills with calcium. Alright, so as I was saying, the collagen matrix of the interior of the bone over time fills with calcium. That's why we use veal bones for making demi, because they have a higher concentration of calcium. That calcium is going to lend to more viscosity, better stock, better demi. Beef bones are more solid. Um, they're better for feeding people with, not necessarily as good for making a very thick stock. Elastin is the second kind of connect connected tissue. Uh, collagen is the first, elastin is the next. What I want you to think of is there's two types of silver skin, heavy duty and lightweight. This is the heavy duty. Elastin is one of two types of silver skin. It's the toughest of the two. Uh, it's what f is found connecting bone to bone or muscle to muscle. It's the ligaments and tendons. The best way to feel it is if you're sitting down, grab your knee, right? Okay, now just under your patella, you can feel that kind of funky stuff. Um, if any of you remember going to the doctor when they used that hammer, maybe this is back in the day, I'm dating myself, but they would smack it right there and it would cause your knee if it was hanging off the edge of the table to flex. Well, it's a tendon, and that tendon is made up of lig um, sorry, elastin. <coughs> it also makes up blood vessels. Blood vessels are essentially pumps that spread over the entire uh, part of the body, and they're actually pumping the blood through the body. So you can imagine that its name tells a story. Elastin has to be elastic in nature. Another place that the elastin is found is in the back strap. It's a very thick band of connected tissue that runs down the back of the vertebrae, and it helps to hold the head upright. If you were to compare a human to, let's say, a cow, the human would have a very thin band because we stand we stand upright. We utilize the two joints in the upper portion of our neck called the atlas and the axis, and the head kind of balances and bobbles. Um, the animal that's walking on all fours to head hold its head upright, it needs the use of the back strap. The third type of, of silver skin is the silver skin lightweight, which I was talking about. It holds muscle to muscle, and it holds skin to muscle. Um, it allows us to easily pull the muscles apart. So when you're when you're pulling muscles apart, or when we are going to in the lab and we're seaming muscles, what actually allows us to seam the muscles out is the reticulin that holds those bundles together. Um, the elastin holds the muscle to the bone, and the reticulin holds it in a specific group specialized to its motion or locomotive action that it's taking part in. It's also the netting that suspends the fat around organs. So if, when we were taking the fat off of the ribeye, there's certain fat that I said would be good for adding to ground beef, like if we're making at 80-20. And then there's certain fat that I said, this, this has the netting, this has the reticulin. It's not going to be great for grinding because of it. It always gets ground up, and it doesn't, it doesn't give you that nice, clean feel. It gives you that kind of grisly stuff. Meat inspection. Meat inspection is mandatory. All meat produced for human consumption must be inspected before distribution. Uh, meat inspection is done by the branch of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, known as the FSIS, or Food Safety and Inspection Service. 
Uh, the FS iOS was basically developed in 1906, 1906 uh, with the inception of the Wholesome Meat Act, which was passed by Upton Sinclair. It wasn't passed by Upton Sinclair, but it was actually passed by some of the words that he used. Um, throughout class, you hear me say, you know, don't back down, always speak your mind, uh, do so respectfully, but question authority. Um, Upton Cl Sinclair was a writer, uh, and he was actually writing this book called he was actually writing the book. He was writing uh, socialist propaganda. He was writing little bits of paper or little flyers to get people to understand that the slaughterhouses in Chicago or the machine, uh, he used the slaughterhouse as an example, but the machines of modern technology and the machines of modern corporations were putting the man down and, and controlling the man and constraining the man. Um, and so he decided to focus specifically on slaughterhouses in Chicago and he exposed the workings and the corruption of the slaughterhouse business through the eyes of an immigrant family in the early 1900s. You can tell the book became popular. It's been printed many times. Uh, some of you might have read it in high school. I did. Uh, it's actually a great book, but there's probably only about 13 to 15 pages that really have to do specifically with the inner workings of uh, a, a slaughterhouse, but they were so uh, kind of inspiring or inspiring in a negative way to uh, the American people that in 1906, the USDA passed um, the Wholesome Meat Act, and FSIS was born. Just want you to see that again. Nice moves, nice moves. Good animation, cool. Meat inspection. Uh, there's another method of meat inspection called custom processing. It's the only exception of meat that doesn't have to be inspected in the same way. Sometimes uh, uh, a processor is going to process a deer or something for retail sale. Um, he's basically getting paid to just cut the meat and then give it back to the person who shot the animal or who owned the animal or who raised the animal. The understanding there is that the animal will not be sold uh, and there will be no money exchanged other than that which was paid to the processor for the processing of the animal. Um, sometimes you'll see custom processing where uh, maybe the, the hunter who shot the animal say, hey man, you take the fore quarter, I'll take the hind quarter, um, but, but custom processing is the only exception to meat that does not have to be stamped and inspected. It's not being sold and not being given to the public. What are they looking for in meat inspection? Well, yummy stuff like this, of course. Uh, this is the bottom lobe of a lung. Uh, and this is uh, this could have been a small laceration. It could have been an infection. It could have been um, some sort of infected air that got into the cow's lungs as it was in the barn. Um, and this led to one speck that got inflamed. And and this is nasty. And you don't want that. They look for stuff like that. They're looking for anything that is out of the norm. They're looking for antemortem. Antemortem is where they're looking at in the animals prior to them being dispatched or killed. They're looking to see that the animals were able to carry themselves into facility on their own, that they're standing upright, and that they look well. Um, they're also looking for post-mortem inspection, and that's when they're going to look at how the animals are processed, how the skin was removed. They're going to be looking at the facilities and the equipment. They're going to be making sure that the facilities are in compliance with the USDA regulations. Anything that looks funky, anything that's out of the normal, that's what they're going to call it. That's what's going to cause them to tag the animal prior to distribution. The inspection of a carcass will be identified through the application of the official federal inspection stamp. The inspection stamps are actually issued or, or distributed much like a police badge. Um, each inspector will be given a specific number, and that will be specific to them. Each plant also has a number. Um, this ins is inspected by, inspected by Inspector 42. Um, this is the state inspection. Now, state inspection is different than federal inspection. Um, if performed by the state, it will have the state stamp on it. This is a federal inspector, this is a state inspector. Um, the reason that state inspection is good is because state inspection had to, in order to remain state inspection, had to exceed federal guidelines. Um, once they proved that they were f exceeding federal guidelines, so they're generally doing things better than federal inspectors, and they're mandated by the states to have more inspectors in the facilities. Inspection of meat has nothing at all to do with the grading of meat. Inspection of meat means that your chances of getting sick from eating it are greatly reduced because its presence was blessed with the federal government putting their hands on your meat. Scary. All right, so USDA grading is something different completely. 
Grading is paid for by the packer processor, and that's why meats that are graded are generally much more expensive. Presently, beef grading accounts for over 95% of the approximately 13 billion pounds of meat that's graded annually. The primary reason that they're grading it is because if it has a grade, people will associate a certain kind of quality, and they will send it out, and it's going to get a better, a more, more pennies for it. What we learned yesterday in, le in the lecture when I showed you those pictures of the ribeyes is you don't really need to know the quality grade because if you understand how that fat is distributed on the interior of the muscle, that's all you need to know. That's all they're looking at, and that's what's going to cause them to identify a, or, or set a particular grade over another one. A meat inspector will grade the carcass before, they, before it's broken down into retail or wholesale cuts. What that means is you don't get a chuck that's a choice and a, a leg, I mean a, uh, a short loin that's a, a select and yes, you got shanks that are a cut or canner. What they do is they cut it between ribs number 12 and 13. As we know, it's between the rib and the short loin, and that process is called ribbing. Once they do the ribbing, they let it bloom. They let the oxygen get to the fat, and they allow it to bloom, and so they can see it. And they actually put something called a videometer onto it, which measures or weighs that constitution or the, the concentration of fat in the meat. <laughs> meat grading is broken down into two categories, quality and yield. What we're prim primarily concerned with in restaurants is quality. If we were a sausage maker and we were concerned with bringing in uh, whole carcass animals but we wanted little waste to maximum production, then we'd be focused on yield. Yield is going to indicate, that, as we've learned from butcher test cards, the quantity of edible meat in a carcass uh, to non-edible meat. Really not very popular or, or not something we're going to use in restaurants. <coughs> meat grading or yield grading is expressed with a number representing the yield. Um, it's one through five, and uh, one is going to be the best yield, and five's not going to be so good. Here's the, the common yields. Um, it's going to tell you the percentages under 45.4, blah, blah, blah. So there's the yield. Again, it's nice to know. You don't need to know because it's not something, unless you go into sausage production, that's it's, it's really going to concern you. Quality is going to determine the eating the eating quality is specific to the tenderness the juiciness and the flavor when we talked about the even distribution of fat uh, we talked about the meat being texturally advantageous it's going to be directly connected to how the meat will be cooked based on the quality of the meat the greater the quality the less cooking time will be required uh, the more moist the meat will be the quality grade will be stamped on the animal in the form of a shield and the quality rating is most commonly performed on beef, veal, lamb, pork, and chicken. Here ends the reading. I uh, hope you had a good time, and we will talk to you later.